we are going to compute gradient divergence and curl for vectors, second order tensors, higher order tensors, big, big objects. And uh, what we are saying here is that that gradient is just one example of differentiating with respect to a vector. When you say gradient, basically what you are doing is that you are differentiating with respect to a vector. But up till now, you only knew how to differentiate with respect to a scalar. You are, you are only on x-axis. And there's a function defined. The function itself is on y-axis and your domain is on x-axis. That's all that they were teaching you from the whole of secondary school. All that mathematics that we thought was hard was just that limited. It was just that, just that trivia. And that's all just differentiating with respect to a scalar. And you thought you had done math. You are, just, you are just about to start math now. And what happens is that when we are expanding the domain, we are not just playing. That is reality. That's what happens in real life. It's just that because your math was weak and your ability to, uh, in, in, to ingest things that are harder than that was limited. That's why we restricted ourselves to that all along. The real issue is that you need to differentiate with respect to bigger objects. And you also need to differentiate not only scalars, you also sometimes need to differentiate vectors. You sometimes need to differentiate tensors. And you need to differentiate them not, with, not only with respect to scalars, you need to differentiate them with respect to uh, vectors or tensors also. Once you begin to do that, your definition of differentiation or derivative breaks down completely because those objects do not allow division. So what this class is trying to do is to give you a bigger definition of differentiation that does not involve the division that you are used to, that you can, you can actually define derivative without necessarily having to divide anything, without taking the limit of a quotient, because derivative by definition is the limit of a quotient as the quotient tends to zero. But we want to change that and generalize. If we are successful in generalizing that, if we are successful in generalizing that, the derivative we have has a name. It is a Frechet derivative. But don't worry about that. Just know that it is what we are doing is a generalization of the derivative that you know. And the derivative will not necessarily be a scalar to a scalar. It could be anything differentiated with anything. Freche will undo everything. We handle everything nicely. But before you can get that derivative, you have to deal with what is called the Gato differential. That Gato differential is a generalization of your ordinary differential. And in fact, once you understand that, everything, including the Frechet derivative, is just a, a piece of cake. The real, the real kernel of everything we are doing is the definition of the Gato differential. So what we will do, we will define the Gato differential. After we have defined it, we will see that if the functions involved are uh, domain of scalar, and range of scalar, that the Gato differential is exactly the differential you are used to. It's exactly the same. Once we, so once we do that, once you can connect that, then we can now build everything on it. So, and the Gato differential does not require you to understand anything. It just it requires you to accept a definition. And we are giving you the definition by saying this is what, okay, let us say I bring a little child to you and say, this little child's name is Somto, Somto Chuku. That's the name of the little child. You don't need to start knowing, okay, what is the meaning of Somto? Why did they name him Somto? What, why, why, what, what? That's not your business. Your business is that this is the name of this child, period. If you want to attention on a child, call the name, the child will answer you. That is what a definition is. So there is nothing to understand in the definition except knowing what the definition itself 
is. Once you know what the definition is and you are concerned, and anytime you see that thing, you refer back to the definition you are given, problem solved. We will define the Gato derivative for you. Then after defining it for you, we show you that that Gato derivative we have just defined, if it is a scalar function in the scalar domain, it degenerates to your ordinary differential. So, so once you understand that, you now know that, but we can define it for anything to anything. We can define it for a vector in a, a scalar domain. We can define it for a vector in a vector domain. We can define it for a vector in a tensor domain. We can define it for a scalar in a tensor domain. We can define it for anything in any domain. It does not matter what combination of domain and function you have, the Gato differential is always defined. If you understand the Gato differential, the next step is a piece of cake which is to now show you what the derivative is in those terms. So let us know that that's what we are trying to do because you might, uh, the beautiful thing of today's lecture is this. Let me tell you, uh, I don't know whether I already wrote it here. I think I wrote it, I wrote something somewhere which I want to show you. Aha. Can somebody read for me what I typed in this corner? I want to be sure you saw it. Go to the chat room and tell me what, I wrote in this corner, in the, in the top. What did I write in the top right corner of my screen? <clears throat> Can you read what is on the top right corner of my screen? If you can read it, type it and let me see that you can see it. Okay, somebody said crackers of the world unite. Maybe. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Can anybody guess why I said that? Can anybody guess what I'm driving at? Can you, can you imagine what I'm driving at? Mm -mm. Now I know you know. Do you know what I've tried to tell you? Yes, Ogochuku, I know people will cry. That's not the reason. But I know people will crap. You are right. But there's a reason. Instead of what I say, yes. Okay. Okay. Let me tell you the okay, uh, that we should just cram this one. And we don't have to know. Aha. Bolu Atife, you are almost right. What I am telling you is that in today's lecture, whether you understand it or you don't understand it, just if you cram it, you will be okay. Because there will be a pattern that you can use to solve problems. Yeah. It's, it's, but the crime is not needed. So what I'm doing is this. I'm addressing two sets of people. I am addressing the people who want to understand. And I will make sure if you want to understand, you will understand what I'm teaching you today. If I do not succeed in making you understand, then let the crimes of the world unite because they will be okay. In the sense that you cram the thing, walk through the examples. As you are walking through the examples, if you work enough examples, you will understand as a result of your working through the examples. So you can understand now, if you want, you can cram and then go and walk all the examples and you will see that if you pay attention to what you are doing, you will understand. So I do not because I'm, uh, this is my third week on this set of slides. Each time I teach, the last two times I've taught this set of slides, I went home without convincing myself that I have, that you understand me, that you understand the class. So, and I do not want to leave this point until I get that conviction. Today is my last day of it. I will try very hard to make sure you understand. But if I don't succeed, don't worry. But pay attention, just allow yourself a little bit of freedom. I believe you will understand what I'm teaching you today. I believe so. If you just pay a little bit of attention. Okay, so that's why I wrote Grammars of the World Unite. So what I am saying here is that we cannot, we cannot define derivative the way we've been defining it. So we now decided to define the differential. We define the differential with this quotient. You can see that in this quotient, no matter what the function is, whether it is uh, whether x is a vector, you see x, whatever x is, h must be. 
h is so, some increment in x. So this function is a function of x and some increment in x. So you can either write x h or x and dx, whichever way. You are just talking about something that is just a small perturbation in x. We define this differential as evaluate the function just a little bit away from, uh, from x. That is add alpha h to x. That is just slightly away from x. Subtract the function evaluated at x. So if the function was a scalar, this one would be a scalar. If it was a vector, it would be a vector. If it was anything. And you can always divide any of these things with a scalar because the only thing that is, the only division that is involved is a scalar. So there's nothing wrong with this thing. And that, that thing is defined as your Gato differential. It is a differential that you have divided with the, with the perturbation from, so if h is, as h is turning to zero, whether h was small or not, it doesn't matter because h, sorry, alpha was small or not, it doesn't matter because alpha is going to be made smaller and smaller and smaller and we'll be computing this quotient. If you can find this, if you can find this thing, that is called the Gato differential of x and h. Now, there is something on the right-hand side, which is a computational formula. We can, this is the definition, and this is a computational formula. And we spend time to show that this quantity and this quantity are the same. We've done that already. So this is the definition of the Gato differential. This is a computational formula for it. Anytime we want to compute it, this is what we shall do. And the equivalency of the Gato differential and the computational formula has been established. If you don't remember it, go down the slide. You will see it is established. You can compute the Gato differential. So this is the quantity that is important. Now, the next thing we did is to show that this thing that we are calling the Gato differential, the time when the function itself is a scalar, and the domain is a scalar, if you write it out, you are going to get the same thing as the differential you are used to of a scalar. So you can see, you remember that the f dx dx, the f dx times dx is equal to df, which is the differential, which is just a small change, which is just a small change in uh, the function. We, have, we call it a differential, it's a small change in the function. So this is going to form the basis of, this thing you are seeing here is the basis of all we shall do. This is all we are working on. And let me explain to you the trick. It's a very simple trick. And that trick has far-reaching results. Remember what we are trying to do. We want to define derivative of anything with respect to anything, no matter whether they are scalars or vectors or tensors or anything. And we say we can't do that because Usually, you need to differentiate with the domain variable. You need to divide with the domain variable. But you can't do that with a vector. You can't divide with a vector. You can't divide with a tensor. So what do you do? What you do is that you remember that differential, this is the relationship between a derivative and differential. This, this, this uh, expression gives this different derivative as if it is a, it is a, it's a division. What we are saying is that forget that. Just take this df dx as a derivative. Don't close your mind to the fact that it is looking like a division. Just take it as a derivative. Uh, and in fact, what what I will, let me let me write the way you should think of this. Let me let me let me go off and write it. I will just insert shape. Uh, let me insert a shape here. And I will insert uh, an equation inside that shape. And I will say F prime times the X is equal to D of
Okay. What I am telling you now is this. This quantity here, which is the FDX, DX, call this the FDX, call it F prime, so that we block our mind from the fact that it looks like a, a, a division. Just assume, you know that when we multiply F prime with DX, we get the differential in F. For just to make it look different, we instead of using the small d you are used to, let us just put it as big D, just to show we are doing something. We want to do something a little bit different. But you remember that you you've always known this relationship. That is, the derivative times the x will give you the differential in f. Let me ask the class, is this thing I wrote in yellow, is it clear to everybody that you are used to it? I want to just see how many people will we, we say that they understand that. If you understand that, I want to know that you can see that this times tx is equal to the differential in f. Please, as many people as understand that, if you, if you can tell me you understand this, I will make sure you understand what I am trying to do. Because this is all you need to understand. This is all. If you remember this, because all we are trying to generalize is this. More people, more people, more people. I want to see the number of people that... Uh... So I'm asking you, do you understand this yellow statement? That it is the same thing as this statement here? That what you have written in yellow is the same thing as this statement. If you understand that, we have no problems. And you know that whenever f is not a scalar and x is not a scalar, instead of this thing now being the derivative differential, you know, it now becomes the Gato derivative. Finish. <laughs> so this is the ordinary differential if the dx is a scalar and f prime is a and f is a scalar. But when it is not, it is down the Gato differential. So and the Gato differential is defined. You can always compute it. You can always compute it with this, with either this one or this one. If you come and here, if I give you any function, you can always write this out. If I give you this function, if I give you any function f of x, you can always say, okay, uh, you can always add alpha h to x anywhere x of course, change it to x plus alpha h. That is the meaning of this and then subtract the f of x and divide the difference with alpha. That's something, that's just the definition. That's the sum to the, the name of the girl that I'm introducing to you, a little girl. Uh -huh. So I'm just saying that is her name. Uh -huh. So this is the meaning of Gato. And this Gato, once you, once the thing that are involved are all scalars, both the range and the domain, then it gives you the same thing as your well-known differential and this relationship that the differential multiplied by the change in the domain is equal to the differential in the function, the derivative multiplied by the change in the domain is equal to the differential of the function. You, this is your bread and butter. You've been doing this since your secondary school. You don't have any problem with this. This is what we are now going to generalize. So you already now know that we can compute the Gato something, okay? So what's the next thing, okay? The next thing, after all the things I've said, is that <clears throat> imagine, imagine. Okay, let me just bring this on now. Let me copy. Let me cut this. Now, see what is happening here. I am now telling you this. Remember that for any function, whether it is a, a tensor or a vector of a variable, whether the variable is vector or tensor or whatever, you can always formulate the Gato derivative. So the left-hand side here is given. You can do it. This dx, this change is a change in the domain. If, it is, if the domain is a scalar, it's a change in a scalar. 
If the domain is a vector, it's a change in the vector. If the domain is a tensor, it is a change in the tensor. It doesn't matter. You can always subtract a vector from another vector, and that will give you a change in the vector. You can always subtract, uh, because addition is always defined. Subtracting a negative is the same thing as addition. It's the same thing as addition. Subtraction is the addition of the negative. That's all. So this, this, so what happens is that this is always computable, no matter what quantities we are dealing with. This is always known because if you know that the domain is a, is a vector, this is a differential of a vector. If the domain is a tensor, this is a differential of a tensor. If the domain is a scalar, this is a differential. So the only unknown here is this thing we are trying to find, which is the derivative. What this line is telling you here is that if I give you any function, go ahead and compute this Gato differential. Go ahead and talk about the change in that, in the domain, which you can always do. If it is possible for you to find something, no matter what that something is, this thing in the, in the bracket, we call it grad, call it any name you like, such that when it is in any product relationship with this, if it can give us the gateau, that thing is the derivative we are looking for. Can't you see that it is a generalization of this statement? You can see that in, in scalars, the differential is the derivative times dx. I am now saying, if you can compute the gateau and you know what the change, the change in the domain is, if it is possible for you to get a relationship, to get something which way we multiply it in any form, that multiplication can be a scalar times a scalar. It can be a scalar product. It can be a vector product. It can be a tensor product. But whatever product it is, if by the time we compute this thing, no matter what it is, and we can get the gateau that we have just computed, if it is possible, then this thing that we have found here is the, de is the differential we are looking is the derivative. You know that all along, we are just looking for a way to get the derivative of a function domain is not a scalar and whose value is f is not a scalar. And we say we can't do it the normal way. So we just capitalize on this relationship and say that, well, since we can always calculate the gato and we can always know the differential uh, once we know what domain we are in, is it possible to find something which is in a multiplicative relationship with uh, this different this uh, domain differential that will give us our gato? If it if for us to find it, then that thing is the derivative we are looking for. We just decide to call that thing. Grad. Everybody calls it grad. You can decide if your name is, uh, let me look at the names that I've seen in the class. Uh, okay, I can see Olaoye. Instead of saying grad, we can say this is the Olaoye of f of x. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you call it. Whatever you like, call it. But the important thing about it is that once that thing is in a multiplicative relationship that gives, that produces the gato, that thing, Whatever it is, is the derivative we are looking for. So, so we now have a particular set of systematic pattern to calculate the derivative of anything with respect to anything, and this is it. So, a scalar, a vector, or tensor value function in a scalar, vector, or tensor value domain is said to be Fréché differentiable. If a subdomain exists in which we can find Grad f of x such that this relationship holds. The question finds the gradient of a function in terms of its operating on the domain object, which is to obtain the Gato differential. The nature of grad of f of x, as well as the kind of product between gradient and the so the nature of this, as well as this one, is suspended. We can find that out later, but just imagine it's possible for us. The nature of them will depend on the value and type of function and the type of argument involved. In a simple case of a scalar valued function of a scalar argument, we are back to the regular derivative, which can be seen, and that this, this dot here will just become ordinary multiplication. But in other cases, it will be something else. If there, there will be cases where it will be ordinary multiplication, 
There will be cases where it will be dot product. There will be cases where it will be cross product. There will be cases where it will be a contraction. It, but and it will be some kind of product. And what we are saying is that what product it is will be determined by the context. There will be, we will have enough information when we get there to know what kind of product this is. And, it will not, and we will therefore know what kind of object this is. That is all. And once we now begin to go through specific examples, if you keep bringing your specific example to this place, you will now have a pattern on how to get it. And this is the definition of grad. Remember, I am not just throwing grad at you. I am telling you where it comes from. It comes from finding something that you multiply by the difference in the domain that will give you your gato, your gato uh, differential, which is defined. So once the gato differential is defined, the Frechet derivative is defined, and that is the derivative we are looking for, which can be the derivative of anything with respect to anything. And we have now done this definition without worrying about division by scalar, division by vector, division by... So the only thing that happens here is that when we are getting the Gato differential, there's the division by scalar involved always. No matter what object you are looking at, there's the division by scalar. So we do not have to divide by the tensor or the vector or anything to get this going. And we can now get our derivatives. So the gradient or Frechet derivatives are defined by this which is, an, which is a generalization of this statement that you are used to. Just that what the multiplication is, is not, we, are not, uh, we are not committing ourselves as to what this multiplication will mean, and we are not committing ourselves to what this is. But if you can find a relationship like this, if you can find it, if you cannot find it, no problem. But if you can find it, then you can find what you found there is the differential, you are, is the derivative you are looking for, if you can find it. So we are now going to go into specific examples and we'll see that we can actually find these things. And well, as, as long as we are finding it, no problem. So, so let us now go to what, uh, then we have this, uh, we, we, I, I now show you that in a case of, in a case of an argument being scalar and the function being scalar, you are back to what you knew before. When this uh, function is a scalar and the argument is a vector, the, the thing is a dot product, therefore this grad is now a vector. Uh, before we go on, I want to see whether you can immediately find examples of number two. I want you to tell me whether you can find, I want to see if anybody can see. I will tell you if I, I will just, I'm testing you. If you succeed, fine. If you don't succeed, I'm going to tell you the answer. Uh, is it possible for us to see a scalar function of a vector? Can you find me? Is there anything you notice that is a scalar, but it's function of a vector? Is there anything you know? Even though the thing itself, the, the function itself is a scalar, but the argument it has is a vector. Can you tell me anything that you know very well? Is there anything you know? which is a scalar in its own, in its own right, but the, the argument is a vector. You will pity yourself when I tell you this because it's really very close to you where you are sitting, wherever you are. The example I'm going to give you. I want somebody even if you don't know, tell me, tell me you don't know, because I just want to be sure that you are listening to me. I'm going to tell you the answer, but I want to know whether you, okay, let me type the question, because some people don't even get the question. Can you give me an example of a scalar function whose argument or domain is a vector? Can you find me an example? 
of an, of uh, because why are we spending time if they are, if we are just talking theory? Is there something that its argument is a scalar, but the function itself is a scalar? Sorry, the argument is a vector, but the function itself is a scalar. You supply. You supply a scalar. Okay, the magnitude of a vector, the magnitude of a vector is a scalar, but it is a function of a vector. So the the, the value is a scalar, but the but it's defined on top of the vector domain. So it's a function of a vector. Temperature, good. In fact, that's the one I was uh, looking for. Agbo, Ajibola. Temperature, temperature, temperature because. Where you are, in the room where you are, we can move from point to point. We can define, every point defines a position vector. So if you start take T there, T is a function of all those position vectors, even though T itself is a scalar. So, so what can, then what can the derivative of T with respect to that vector be? That is the temperature gradient. The temperature gradient is not a scalar. The temperature itself is a scalar, but the temperature gradient is a vector because the, it is a function of a vector. So grad of T is so, so, so when you get here, it is the product of grad of T dot the X that will give you the uh, gateau. So the, that means that the temperature gradient is a vector. <laughs> it's a vector. Even though temperature itself is a scalar quantity because what we need to multiply this, the multiplication here is a scalar product. Because what you have on this side is a is a vector. What you have on this side is a is a, is a, a what you have on this side is a scalar, and it is something multiplying a vector. How can you multiply what what in what other way could you multiply a vector with something that will give you a scalar? It's the only way <laughs> is that you multiply the thing, the thing you are multiplying must be a vector, and the product between them must be a scalar product. So that is an example that of what we are looking for. Or what, what is an example of what we are what we are talking about? So, so if you now want to find that grad, which is the derivative, which is the Frechet derivative, this way you do it is you start with the you start with the uh, gato, and then you now find something which we, when you dot it with the x will give you the gato, and that thing is the grad of five. 